In the panic of the pandemic, when trillions of tax dollars were being spent on health care fixes, it became open season for fraudsters. What kind of money are we talking about for a test like that? So uh, we saw uh, the average um, payment for that is about $7,000. No wonder they were trying this out. It's very lucrative. This week, we follow the money to track some incredible scams that cost American taxpayers billions of dollars. Hong Kong is one of the world's key financial cities. It's come under harsh rule by China. I'm the first victim. This week, we're in London to meet activist Simon Chang. His story may be a warning about China's next move. Are you worried about Taiwan? This is what the fight is for. It's about his future. And civil rights lawyer Ben Crump talks about the landmark lawsuit against Baltimore over the city's failing schools. When you look at the situation in Baltimore, what are some of the facts or notes that stood out to you? So many parents were coming to me telling their story. They want it better for their children. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We've spent trillions of tax dollars on COVID-related aid and health care. For context, one trillion is a million, million dollars, 12 zeros on the end. And we already know there's been billions upon billions of dollars in fraud so far, not counting the ones that got away. Today, we follow the money and profile one of the biggest COVID scams you may not have heard about, but are paying for all the same. It involves Medicare, genetic tests, and elaborate kickback schemes. When COVID hit, the government made temporary changes so it would be easier for older people on Medicare to get health care at home. Telehealth can help with many of your day-to-day -day health care needs. Some of the changes involve telehealth, seeing doctors online instead of at the office. Pressure. You can use telehealth to connect with your care team and track your treatment plan. Fraudsters quickly found ways to exploit that shortcut, according to Omar Perez Ibar. He's special agent in charge of the Inspector General's Office for Health and Human Services. Perez helped ferret out a major Florida kickback scheme centered on genetic testing. Genetic testing, it's a test that uses your own DNA to determine if you have a predisposition for one of the suites of the genetic tests that are out there. Um, in this particular case, they were focused on cancer genetic testing. Normally, a doctor orders any medically necessary genetic tests only after an in-person medical exam. But during COVID, in-person visits weren't required in order for the doctor to get paid by Medicare. Scamsters began recruiting patients at malls, churches, door-to-door -door or on the phone, convincing them to get genetic testing they didn't need by claiming it was free or giving them gift cards or prepaid cell phones. Labs collected big payments from Medicare and gave illegal cash kickbacks to the recruiters. Oftentimes the tests were never performed. If they were performed and they were sent back, it was sent maybe to the patient, not to the physician. Sometimes the physicians would see this and say, I don't really understand you know, what this means. How does this help me? Um, so it really was a sham all the way through. And who is getting paid? How is money being passed? So Medicare um, was paying the labs that were uh, purportedly running these tests. But in general terms, you had, again, a number of recruiters or telemarketers that were out there, again, luring these patients to get in. Then they had a number of doctors within uh, a telehealth uh, center. They were the ones who, in turn, would authorize the test. Now, Medicare requires that there be a doctor-patient relationship. That didn't happen. Before COVID, Perez and his team were already looking at a dozen genetic test labs involved in a case they built called Operation Double Helix, referring to DNA structure. That case led to a focus on two men, Michael Stein and Lionel Palatnik. Prosecutors claim Stein arranged for doctors to authorize cancer and heart genetic test orders on patients they never saw in person and sent them on to Palatnik's labs in exchange for kickbacks. What kind of money are we talking about for a test like that? So uh, we saw uh, the average 
um, payment for that is about seven thousand wow. uh, dollars but we saw it as low as four thousand and as high as fifteen thousand uh, dollars it depends again on what types of tests genetic tests they were uh, performing on the patient no wonder they were trying this out it's very lucrative so lucrative it turns out lots of con artists got the same idea criminals across the country are exploiting the ongoing pandemic to enrich themselves creating schemes to victimize beneficiaries and steal from federal health care programs. In recent years, prosecutors have brought many cases. There was a similar scheme in Georgia involving $1.1 million in fraudulent Medicare claims, a $160 million case in Connecticut, Washington, D.C., New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. 48 people were charged, including 15 medical professionals. Another $160 million fraud case in Florida and Georgia with 67 charged. A $214 million genetic testing fraud case in California. The married couple previously convicted on felony medical fraud allegedly bought real estate and luxury items with their profits. $250 million in illegitimate claims in Michigan, Illinois and Minnesota. And a $2.1 billion scheme across Florida, Georgia and Louisiana. And I think a lot of people, when they hear about this kind of fraud, they may think it doesn't touch them because they may not understand this money comes from a pot of money that a lot of ordinary Americans have paid into. First of all, Medicare is not a victimless crime um, because the first victims, in my opinion, starts with you and I. Uh, if we look at our paychecks, uh, all of us pay into the Medicare uh, Medicaid program. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, our parents, uh, our grandparents, our, our loved ones are all uh, part of uh, the program, and we're the ones being defrauded. Were doctors considered in some cases to be part of the fraud or just unwitting participants? In some instances, they were unwitting. Again, they worked for a telehealth company, and they were asked to see and review um, services or claims that were coming into them, right, orders. But we did know, and we do know, um, that there are uh, a number of physicians that uh, knew precisely because they weren't really having conversations with the patients. And if they did, it was very minimal, but yet they submitted or allowed their company to submit a claim for a 30 to 45 minute visit when that in fact didn't take place. Palatnik stood out, Paris says, because of how much his medical test lab business exploded during COVID. Again, in 2018, uh, he had only billed about $2.8 million. Uh, in 2019, it had gone up to about $9.8 million. And in 2020, uh, it was, uh, again, $90 million billed, uh, about 73 uh, or so, kind of made it through, and then 50 was what was paid. Yeah. For all the crooks trying to steal, Perez points to aggressive enforcement. A special strike force for health care fraud has charged a total of more than 4,200 people who billed Medicare more than $19 billion. If uh, you specifically maneuver yourselves, right, to take advantage of uh, the population's most vulnerable victims, which tend to be ours, the elderly, uh, the disabled, and, um, and children, then you, in, you uh, activate that innate um, kind of hunger in us as watchdogs, and we're going to get on that particular sniff, right, on that trail, and we're going to come after you. Stein, one of the defendants, has pleaded not guilty and is scheduled for trial next spring. Coming up next on Full Measure, a Hong Kong activist who disappeared and survived to tell his harrowing story. Hong Kong and Taiwan are two regions of China that have governed like business centers and democracies. But China has been working to bring both closer to the communist fold and squash pro-democracy movements. The world is focused on the tense situation in Taiwan, where many are seeking independence. That's where activist Simon Chang factors in. Some say his harrowing story in Hong Kong portends Taiwan's fate. I spoke with Chang in Great Britain, where he's been granted asylum. Simon Chang's ordeal began in August 2019 at a rail station in central Hong Kong. Chinese officers unexpectedly arrested him upon his return from a trip to mainland China. I'm the first victim for this kind of human rights abuse. 
Did you know they were Chinese officers? I knew that because they were in uniform. Uh, but they gave me no reason why I've been stopped there. At the time, Cheng was a diplomat in Hong Kong, employed by the British to deal with trade and investment. He became a target of the Chinese after he reported to Great Britain on pro-democracy protests. China accused the UK of meddling in its affairs, and Chen was treated like a spy. He describes a lengthy ordeal in which he was accused of soliciting prostitution and tortured. And I put into the cell and asked me to sit on the tiger chair, which is the chair like this, but I've been buckled up, I cannot move. And it seems like I've been a really serious criminal. And outside of the cell, they tried to interrogate me and ask me a bunch of really weird questions. And they, they said, what do you think about Hong Kong? And I think, oh, it's, it's going to be a really politics. That's to say, why would you join the protest? And who and who you're, you know, they're also around you as a protesters. And what's your work? What's your employment? You work for the UK government. What's their plot? What's their conspiracy behind the protest? Chen ultimately confessed to soliciting prostitution and was ordered detained for 15 days. And said, well, we heard that you said it's a prostitute. You went into the massage parlor. I said, yeah, indeed, I did massage, but I did nothing wrong. During the detention, every day almost, I've been asked out for interrogation. And almost, especially the first week, I've been shackled I've been handcuffed, I've been blindfolded, and even hooted. And what I've been treated, for example, I've been asked to stand still for countless hours, and I cannot even move. And if I move, I've been slammed, they would slam my face, I'd be bitten, and they deprive my sleep as well. Hmm. So this kind of the torture has been continued, uh, and that time I don't know my destiny. I could be in prison for decades, I don't know. That is a fear. And afterwards I'd be put into the personal cell in solitary confinement. To family and friends, Chang was simply missing and his disappearance made international news. After 15 days, the Chinese released him. Still fearing for his safety, he sought and was granted asylum in the United Kingdom. What do you think it's very important for an American audience to know? Well, I would say, yeah, indeed, maybe. I know that lots of U.S. audiences and citizens, they would take democracy for granted because you're born and raised in democracy. And I feel, you know, that we do need to cherish it because lots of people, they have not lucky enough that they could be born in democracy. And actually, we're on the way to fight for it but also what we're fighting for is a basic human rights. We are human being, but it's actually a basic, simple question. What do you think that the human being should be treated? I do believe that we have a freedom to be critical and we wouldn't be in prison just because what we have said. Are you worried about Taiwan? I worry about Taiwan indeed, and very much, because I feel what happens in Hong Kong, and even I would say the fall of the freedom of Hong Kong, is not one of. It's not just a matter of Hong Kong. It's a chain effect. It's a domino effect to foresee what's the future, what's the development of the Chinese regime. So one by one, bit by bit, it would be a world affair and a world issue. So that's why we need to care about Hong Kong, because every time this kind of the human rights abuse, we should stand together. We need to rebuild checks and balance. We not let the dictatorship to go beyond the border any anymore. Cheng says he's been forced to cut all ties with his family and friends in Hong Kong, fearing for their safety. Chinese officials have said that Cheng was detained under the Security Administration Punishment Law and that his arrest was China's internal affair. Head on full measure. This is what the fight is for. This Suing is over Baltimore's failing schools. As in many big cities, the schools in Baltimore are generously funded by taxpayer money, yet utterly failing in terms of achievement. 
Now an unusual coalition of taxpayers and a prominent civil rights attorney is taking on the problem through a novel lawsuit that they hope has national implications. Ben Crump has gained recognition as a civil rights attorney representing families of blacks killed in controversial encounters, including George Floyd, who died after resisting arrest in 2020. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. The police officer who held him down was convicted of murder. Find the defendant guilty. And 17-year-old Trayvon Martin killed in 2012. A jury found the Hispanic man who shot him did so in self-defense. Verdict? We, the jury, find George Zimmerman not guilty. I'm attorney Ben Crump and I'm honored to join. Now Crump is in an unusual alliance with conservative activists in Baltimore who are attacking the city's broken education system. This is what the fight is for. It's about his future. They're suing Baltimore's mayor and school board saying, despite receiving some of the highest funding per pupil in the nation for many years, the Baltimore City Public Schools has expended billions of dollars in taxpayer money while failing to properly educate Baltimore City's children. When you look at the situation in Baltimore for people who aren't familiar with it, what are some of the facts or notes that stood out to you? Well, the fact that so many parents were coming to me telling their story about how their children were not able to read, they were not able to do basic math, and that they wanted better for their children. And obviously we all have heard of the grade changing scandal, which is just deplorable. Baltimore's grade changing scandal was exposed in an investigation by Sinclair's Project Baltimore at Fox 45 News. City schools changed thousands of grades, which could have a significant impact on graduation rates. After that, an inspector general investigated and found that Baltimore teachers changed thousands of failing grades to passing between 2016 and 2020. You know, it's unbelievable that the teachers uh, say they were told to change grades. Uh, for bureaucratic reasons. To give better grades. To give better grades for bureaucratic reasons. Um, the fact that it had been reported that students who had not been to classes for years were still being counted on the roll and given passing grades. And that is what became the scandal because, you know, the state uh, leadership found that there were over 12,000 such grade changes uh, throughout Baltimore and there's no justifiable answer for that. I don't care what technical justification you come up with. It's not right and we have to stand for what's right. What is the racial makeup of those who run the schools here and the student population and how does that factor into the whole debate? You know, I think it's uh, ran by mostly minorities, and I think mostly minorities are being impacted. But I think whether you have black people or white people running the system, the system is still producing the same outcomes. And so what we're saying is we can do better. Let's come to the table. That's what we're saying with this lawsuit. Let's come to the table. If we truly are motivated by trying to give our children a better education, then you shouldn't look at this lawsuit as something nefarious. It should be looked at as something to hopefully get us all to the table to say, let's put politics aside and put our children first. What are some of the reflections you have on the idea that money alone is certainly isn't making achievement happen? We got to try all kind of things because what we have right now isn't working. And so let's don't keep going down the wrong road. If we see it's not working, let's figure out how it can work here in Baltimore. And then that could be a model for cities all across America. Baltimore, if we can get it right here, I do think we can get it right all over America and we can change America for the better as it relates to education. 
The lawsuit against the city and schools recently survived an attempt to dismiss it. It's asking the courts to halt what it calls the waste of millions of dollars of taxpayer funds through the illegal and overarching actions of the city and school system. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? An update to our reporting on deep fakes. Videos manipulated using technology that can make it appear as though people did or said something they didn't do or say. This is Nicholas Cage. In 2019, we reported on growing concerns about deep fakes and whether it's possible to trust images we see online. In simple terms, the process has to do with taking hundreds or thousands of images of the person to be swapped in and sending them through an automated training process putting Hollywood quality special effects within most anyone's reach. By the way, that's Donald Trump as Frankenstein's monster. My favorite is probably Lisa Vanderpump. Uh, Here, the face of actor Jennifer Lawrence is swapped out with actor Steve Buscemi. I don't want to have to say, because who knows when you're going to run into these people. Which Buscemi seemed to find pretty creepy when he was shown a clip on a comedy show. It makes me sad that somebody spent that much time on that. <laughs> now, three years later, comes word that some celebrities are being featured in ads without spending a single moment on set. In this deep fake marketing video by a real estate investment startup, Tesla CEO and Twitter's new owner, Elon Musk, appears to be taken hostage. I should put some of these reality locations on Mars. Whoa. The company using Musk's image says it did not get Musk's consent, but that the video includes disclaimers. Here, former actor Bruce Willis appears to help defuse a bomb in a commercial for a Russian telecommunications company. Mississippi. 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 A publicist for Willis didn't respond when asked whether he gave permission to use his image. The new deepfakes are raising legal questions about outsiders manipulating a celebrity's public image without their consent. Coming up next week on Full Measure. One of the most commonly prescribed drugs in America, now under the microscope, is possibly addictive. I tried to crush them up and snort them at one point, and um, that didn't really work the way I wanted it to. But once I was doing that and I had tried that, I'm really like, I, I know what I'm doing now. I am abusing this drug. We investigate the push to restrict gabapentin next week on Full Measure. If you want to hear more stories, check out our podcast, Full Measure After Hours. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.